one second yeah. here. Uh, I've been asked to make two announcements. Apparently, tomorrow, everyone who is from out of the country is expected to bring their passport. Yes, yes. Everyone needs to bring their passport here, and we will verify that you are here legally, I think. <laughs> no, I'm not sure what the... I'm not sure what the purpose is, but apparently, Stephen, is that right? We, it's Kyle, our fiscal coordinator, needs it for his fiscal regulations at Ohio State. Okay. All right. So it's totally innocent, totally innocent, as you might imagine. <laughs> so, nothing will happen to your passport information at all. All right. The other announcement uh, is pertaining to dinner, way more important. Um, so the cabs are going to, dinner's at 6.15, the cabs will start arriving at 5.45, right out here, um, for whoever's going to go. Um, it's a short 10, 15 minute cab ride. Um, I'll be driving also. Um, so we'll wrap up here 5.30ish. So we have plenty of time um, for three talks and some discussion. So, so cabs at 5.45 and passports tomorrow. So, okay, all right. So this is Catherine Schaefer, and she's already introduced herself to us. So please, okay. All right, um, I, I can't actually tell if this is on. Can you hear me? No. Okay. So it's a, okay. Steven, can you um, assist with the microphone? I mean, I can also stand over here, too. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, is this okay? Yeah, you can hear right. now? Okay. Yes, for real? Okay. Um, so my name is um, Catherine Schaefer, and uh, I ended up here by a very weird, in a weird way that I don't know how to track down this. A system. lot of people are here. In the room, right? I, yeah, okay, so, so maybe that's not so strange. But anyway, I didn't know about this until about two weeks ago, and I didn't know I was speaking today until yesterday, officially. So what I'm presenting was um, put together this morning, and um, I'm a little sleep deprived and not at my most coherent, so caveats. Um, so uh, I am a physicist by training, but um, I'm going to um, characterize myself as a corrupted uh, experimental physicist because I've spent the last um, eight or so years teaching at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, so I'm a physicist teaching physics to art students. Um, and my research background is, in, um, is not in quantum physics. I don't think of myself as being an expert quantum physicist, um, although maybe I'm kind of working in that direction. Um, but it's in uh, nuclear physics, experimental nuclear physics, and in observational cosmology. And I was um, doing research in those fields um, for a bunch of years and hit a point in my career when I got fed up with the sexism in my field um, and took a way left turn to get away from that because I was tired of being bitter all the time about um, <laughs> my life. <laughs> Some of you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, so I went and uh, took a position at an art school and so my full-time teaching job involves translating um, cutting-edge physics into ordinary language. Um, and at the moment I'm kind of in a funny career transition since I have tenure, uh, tenure at an art school is kind of like free license to do anything you want, um, for physicists anyway. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of navigating what is it that I want to be doing, and uh, it involves a, a weird set of things, book writing, some art making, um, and so forth. But one of the things is um, just working with people that I meet who are very interesting on ideas that I find interesting. And um, over the last uh, 18 months, one of the people that I've been working with is Gabby Lemos, who's a Brazilian quantum physicist. Um, and she was a guest at, the, at SAIC um, over a year ago, and we started up a long series of conversations about what quantum physics might mean outside of quantum physics. And we were working on that question in the context of an art school where many people are coming to us um, talking about the relevance of quantum physics to their art practices. So we started to try to formulate some ideas around this and do some writing on it. We had, had a symposium about a month ago um, that was the culmination of some of that work. Um, and we wrote an essay called Obliterating Thingness, which was our attempt to fill a gap um, that we were seeing that there was not um, digestible writing to explain quantum physics and why you might be interested in it. Um, there's, there's a lot of excellent introductory material, but uh, in particular for the arts audience, we felt like that was lacking. So that essay is now in the shared folder for this symposium, and um, it's something you can take a look at. So and on the basis of that um, essay, Alex invited me, and I'm very grateful because this is exactly the kind of thing I enjoy doing, um, making a total fool out of myself in front of smart people. I don't know anything about your fields, um, but it's, it's a super fun opportunity. And since I have been thinking about the question of... Um, what quantum physics might mean way outside of physics, um, and I've been reading through Alex's book. 
I had a lot of um, opinions, and I wanted to sort of formulate those opinions into a tentative taxonomy and a response from a physics standpoint to some of the claims and how to think about them. Um, so I'll try to do that quickly, and um, it's very tentative, again, because I came up with some of the structuring of this idea as of yesterday, but I think it will still be worth, um, I think it might start interesting arguments, um, so if so, that's worthwhile. Um, so I, you know, am messing around with all this whole set of ideas um, largely because a lot of people in my um, art school context read Karen Barad. Um, and just looking at things from the outside from a physicist, there seems to be something going on here where scholars in many fields, um, e.g. Barad, uh, Barad in the humanities and also Alex um, in social sciences, are seeing very far-reaching consequences outside the lab um, for, for quantum physics. And I want to note, first of all, that it's not just seeing those connections, it's really seeking those connections. Um, and there's, I've been trying to kind of get a feel for what is it, what are you trying to do, um, basically, and what is, what is Karen Brad trying to do. Um, and there's many things, obviously, but there's a couple things that I particularly want to, want to comment on. Um, there seems to be a desire to get from quantum physics some kind of impetus for revolutionary change through ideas. Um, uh, and on that, I mean, it's a little puzzling in a way as a physicist that quantum physics is what people are going f towards for that narrative, given that it's 100 years old and it's kind of crusty in a certain way. Like, if you're going to go towards what physicists are talking about now, you know, we have other things that we're doing um, that are really on the, the forefront of our field. So in a sense, it's, it's kind of an old story. Uh, but I'm also really interested in this desire to find something that isn't a metaphor. Um, to find some sort of authority from physics um, that allows you to make claims that go beyond analogy. Um, and so I think what I would like to do, um, and then I guess a third thing is, is um, I'm guessing, and I, I don't know this, but I'm guessing that, that physicists often find your ideas hard to swallow. Not all. <laughs> Not all. Some of the reviews that I've gotten have been extremely positive by physicists. Okay, excellent. Yeah. But so all others, I think it's nonsense, right? Yeah, yeah. right, okay. So, the, so, so to, the, to the fact, I mean, I'm also just expressing this because I often find myself trying to explain Karen Barad's work to physicists who have never heard of her. Um, and I also encounter the, you've got to be kidding me, there's no way that quantum physics has anything to do with identity and gender and all those other things. So um, I've also been in the stance of, of needing to defend against that, the policing of um, the ideas of physics by physicists. So there's a couple of things that I want to comment on. Personally, I think that this desire to seek some kind of authority beyond metaphor, go beyond metaphor, um, or go beyond mere analogy from physics is problematic, um, and I'll explain why. But I also think that the policing physicists tend to do around quantum concepts is problematic. Um, so I think there's, there's reasons not to worry too much about that. Um, so with the recognition that this is representing a, in, a partially worked out personal philosophy of science, um, I'd like to claim that I think there are two places where we can really locate the authority that quantum physics has um, from the standpoint of physics, and it's in a set of empirical observations and a set of equations with recipes um, for how to use those equations to relate them to the empirical observations. We can say the apparatus does this thing, we, we get some kind of a result. We can say we have these equations that let us say something, predict future things about, um, about what's going to go on there. Um, those what we don't have consensus and authority on is the concepts, expressed as concepts. Um, and that is the distinction that I, I particularly want to highlight. There's a major underdetermination problem in, um, in quantum physics if you want to think about it as statements about the world. Um, there isn't a consensus quantum ontology. Um, far from it. It's hugely debated. We, um, and it's weird that that's the case. It's a really different way of thinking about what an equation is than physicists used to in the classical era. In the classical era, you would expect an equation to have symbols in it that, stand, that would stand for reference that you could define, and define it in a, an unambiguous way. Um, and equations like this, or any of the equations that we find in quantum physics, have a different feature, which is they have reference but we can't say what those references are. We can define them sort of through how we, um, are operationally, through what we do. Um, so we know, you know, we're talking about photons, but if you actually 
ask physicists to def or photons and electrons. If you ask physicists to define what photons and electrons, what are the reference of the equations, that is where a gigantic mess opens up. Um, and there are many, many ways of talking about these things. And they are very ontologically distinct um, and competing. They are, they're, they are not compatible at all. Um, so we're not able to make claims about the underlying nature of the reference. That's where we find ourselves. Empirical evidence does not tell us what a photon is. Um, and I would also, you know, I, this is a, a, a test we could potentially perform, probably not here because now we're all thinking about all this on this other level, but if you walk into a room of a bunch of physicists and you ask them all to define what a photon is um, in language that could be understood by anybody, um, my bet, and this is sort of supported by seeing some, some research where they were kind of doing this, um, is that most of the answers are going to be pretty incoherent at first. Um, physicists really don't make sense very much when we talk about the reference of the equations um, and, the, and the, phenom the underlying entities that we believe are participating in our experiments. Um, you'll get a whole bunch of statements about what a photon is that then the physicists will then be able to argue with each other about. And if they get to a point where they resolve their argument, the resolution of the argument isn't going to be language-based, I'm going to argue. It's going to be a gesture, and that gesture is going to be to something in an equation or to a representation of something that happened in an experiment. Um, so I, I do, this picks up on our earlier conversation. It's not fully fleshed out, but I do think that there's something um, separate from linguistic representation that is happening in, in what we're doing, um, or that at least problematizes that. Okay, so just to make that point, um, your claim is that quantum physics can be understood through words. Um, I'm going to say I don't think so in the sense that um, at that point it's philosophy and not established physics. The established physics, the things that we can really agree on and from which we could confer further authority, to me is a pretty limited subset. Um, it's a subset of empirical observations, facts, empirical facts, and um, consistently useful recipes. Um, which is a pretty limited position to be in. And in particular, quantum concepts verbally expressed, like entanglement or photon or complementarity or decoherence, are not accompanied by any consensus in physics about their meaning, their scope of application, or their implications. Um, yes, we use them. And yes, the use of them is important in the practice of physics. But we do not really agree on those, those concepts as concepts. Um, so. Also, um, I would argue that any attempt we make um, to rigorously articulate those concepts opens up a really, really big and deep pit of philosophical confusion. It is only a step from, or two steps from entanglement or photon or complement for any of these concepts, um, observer effect and so forth, before suddenly you're, you're questioning the nature of causality itself, you're invoking the deep structure of space and time, or you're bringing mind into it. It's absolutely right there. It's right around the corner. Um, one, two, three, you know, you're in a giant mess of philosophy. Um, so it, it is really complicated, and this is why shut up and calculate is how we function. Um, because most of us don't want to talk about all this. Okay, so um, now to the taxonomy. So um, looking at a, a set of practices um, that take quantum physics um, in some way out of the, the tight grasp of the quantum physicists, I was just trying to think of a way to organize the different types of things that I, I think are going on there because I think it is helpful to, um, to disentangle them a little bit. And I think most people who are working with that form of translation are doing more than one of these things and often claiming relationships between these practices. And I'm not completely sure that I see those relationships. So that's the, the point of the exercise. Um, okay, so um, first thing you can do is work with the math. And if the f <coughs> way that you're working with the math is you're basically taking the math and applying it to additional physical systems whose with a reference set that has a well-defined relationship to the reference set physicists usually use, is basically just extending physics. And I would argue that that's a way of thinking about what's happening with um, pushing into mesoscale physics, um, quantum biology, depends on the specific um, research effort, but that's an area where I think physicists have plenty of authority. It's basically just physics taking the next step. There's this different thing you could do with the equations, which is take the same equations, uh, which 
have a relationship to the field of quantum physics, but their equations. Um, and as I think was argued in the previous session, we could have ended up with those equations by different means. Take them, apply them to a new reference set that does not yet have an empirically, uh, yet or maybe ever, have an empirically established relationship to the original reference set. So what I mean by this business of original reference set is physicists talk about photons and electrons and atoms. We don't really know what we mean by those statements, but there is something going on there. And if you can't really describe what money is in terms of photons or what decisions are in terms of you know, photons and electrons, it's a different type of thing that you're doing when you use the math. So I would, I would separate those as different practices. Um, then I would classify that there's quite a number of practices that take not the mathematics but the concepts that we associate with the entire set of ideas and work with those concepts in different ways. Some people will take specific concepts from quantum physics as facts of the world um, and, and explore their philosophical consequences. And um, I think it's hard to summarize Karen Barad's work in any, um, at all, because she has, it's, a, it's a lot of ideas. Uh, but in a sense, I would characterize that that's one of the things that she does. Um, Karen Barad, and I'm assuming most people are familiar with her, at least um, the name, takes, um, makes strong statements about the concepts of quantum physics representing facts about the world and then generalizes those um, facts about the worlds to, to explore their philosophical implications. I think it's a slightly different thing um, to, to posit, sorry these, the words are small um, to read, uh, to posit quantum concepts as a way to model phenomena from a different reference set. It's not necessarily claiming, um, I don't know, I haven't fully worked out the distinction between these, these two categories, but I think there's something slightly differently, different going on. Um, in one case, you're saying quantum physics says blah, what does that mean? And in another case, you're saying qu quantum physics gives us this concept of entanglement. I'm going to use entanglement to talk about this thing. Um, in both of those two practices, I would argue that committing to a specific meaning for entanglement, or at least a, a basic structure for that meaning, is a part of it. And modeling the reality as structurally related to that concept is what you're trying to do. There's another way of working with quantum concepts, um, which is what I think is usually dis dismissed as the bad thing we don't want to be doing, which is generative metaphor. Um, the difference here, in, as I would articulate it, being that um, if, you're doing, if you're playing with the ideas from quantum physics, there's, you are open to the idea that an entirely new meaning for entanglement might emerge um, through that play. And it, if there isn't a perfect structural match between your existing idea of the concept and whatever it is that you're modeling with it, okay, it might actually change together. Um, but either of any of these is not really using the equations or the formalism. Um, another thing that I think you could be doing, and I think this is something that Alex is attempting to do um, in, 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 your, in your book, um, is to take the empirical facts of quantum physics and from that define negative claims about ontology that you can make. I'm arguing that we have very few positive statements about ontology that we can make from, on the basis of quantum physics, um, that that's just the situation that we are in. Arguably, you can take our non let's see, how to, how to express this, our failure to see certain things in nature as make a statement that nature is not like certain things. Um, so you have a whole section of negative claims um, from quantum physics exploring that. Um, I would argue that actually the scope of this, if you're really going to stick to what quantum physics says, is really narrow. Um, for example, people will often say, all right, well, there's many different interpretations of quantum physics, but for sure quantum physics is not deterministic. That's not necessarily true. They're perfectly legit interpretations of quantum physics that are deterministic. Um, so the scope of what we can say in a negative sense of what, what the empirical facts alone imply, I think is actually pretty narrow. Um, other things I think that you could <coughs> be doing, um, if you are taking quantum physics out of its, um, its domain where it, it normally comes from, um, you could address the complete and total mess that is the relationship between concept equation and empirical observations in physics. This is the philosophy of science project of what is going on here with the nature of our knowledge um, and the nature of, of knowledge about a real world. Um, item eight is important because the anxiety about this is part of why physicists, I think, often do want to police their, their boundaries so um, intensely. Um, 
is scams such as quantum healing, which is all over the place. I mean, teaching it in art school, 50% of the time people come to me because they're reading Karen Brad, and 50% of the time it's because someone told them that crystals were going to change everything about their lives. And so it's, it's really present, and it's something we feel very sensitive about. So clearly false causal claims, um, but also in a little more subtle, um, there are plenty of fallacies um, that arise around uh, quantum physics, and I'm, I don't know if it's really the right term to apply here, but I always want to phrase it as God of the gaps type arguments. There's a lot of things that quantum physicists can't say, and it leaves you a lot of room to put in whatever it is that you want to exist in the world. Um, so I, w I think there's some fallacious reasoning there. Obviously, there's things where people simply make mistakes, but I would claim that physicists actually do that um, as much as anybody else does. And then the last thing is, um, in my taxonomy anyway, um, is the trivial use case, meaning quantum physics underlies many technologies that are important, um, and those are things that are important to discuss outside of the context of, of just physicists. By trivial use, I don't mean that these are trivial topics, and I'm actually really glad that we opened by um, talking about quantum computing and its potential um, really scary implications, because that's obviously critical. So I guess what I want to say, and I'll wrap up here quickly, um, I want to say of all of these, in my view, the only one of these that doesn't belong in serious academic discourse is scams and fallacies. Um, everything else, as far as I'm concerned, is totally legit, and physicists should not be con complaining about that at all. I think physicists do have from that narrowly defined domain of, of what we can talk about rigorously, we have authority when we're talking about extensions of what we're already doing. We may potentially have some authority in at least articulating the empirical facts of quantum physics that you might use as the basis of negative, for negative claims about un, um, physical ontology. But in a lot of the rest of this, I mean, certainly, if you want to use math, um, to talk about things that are not physics, and you want to acknowledge that that math is also used in quantum physics, there might be some vocabulary overlap, but it's not really a thing that physicists would, should have any issue with. In my opinion, um, first of all, so my opinion, as I think I've uh, expressed, is that the concepts of physics are not things that are well pin pinned down as concepts. Um, so I don't think we should have any um, particular privilege for defining the bounds of those concepts. We can certainly talk about the places where we've hit walls in trying to make sense of those concepts, but I don't think that they belong to physicists in this like tightly controlled way because we can't even figure out what they mean ourselves um, within the confines of what we're talking about. Um, so that is my personal opinion, is that we, we, should, not, um, we should not claim we know what entanglement is. Um, we should not claim that we know what the observer effect is. Um, okay, so, um, and, you know, again, I think often physicists are, ourselves are the most, uh, the worst offenders when it comes to saying quantum physics says X, Y, and Z when it doesn't really. Um, and in, as a, in sort of the sociology of our field, we just say wrong things all the time, and eventually, there's blackboards everywhere, and eventually it goes back to gestures to equations and gestures to representations of results, and that's where we get comfortable, comfortable again. Okay, um, and then, yeah, I didn't say anything about these, so I just wanted to plug it that I think they're, those are interesting. Okay, so let me wrap up and we can do some discussion here. Um, so my, my key points again is um, I'm skeptical of the desire to seek something that's more than metaphor when you take quantum physics outside of um, its original context. And the reason for that is because I just don't know what that would even mean. Um, to, to say that it's more than metaphor would require we have a positive claim of what quantum physics implies, and I don't think we do. Um, you, have to, you have to take that step. So, so that's my, my concern. But at the same time, um, I don't think physicists are justified in drawing tight boundaries and saying that they're the only ones who should be working with these concepts and exploring what they mean. Um, in my opinion, they're, as concepts, they belong everywhere, uh, and they may, in fact, be tied to... Um, really important new ways of thinking about all sorts of problems. So um, I want to further, uh, I mean, this stance that I've articulated should further be read as underscoring that um, huge under, under, unresolved philosophical problems are at hand when we get into this. There, you are always just a step away from what is the nature of causality, what is the nature of mind, what is the nature of space and time, and a number of other um, really fundamental questions. Um, 
and I do, yeah, so I already said this, but I endorse the idea that we can pull the quantum physics concepts away from the field of physics um, and, and work with them. But I will still, um, with the full recognition that it's problematic, it will probably fall apart if you, like, ask me a lot of questions on this, I still want to reserve a space for something that is distinct about the, the knowledge that physics produces. Um, there's something about the power that it has that, that I think it's, um, is different. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> questions or comments? I don't know where to start. Right? I have it right there. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. So I have a question that's kind of, I, I two things that are on my mind with this. Um, what is that, I mean, I don't see metaphors as things that aren't real, but I think about um, our passports, our borders, mm -hmm. real people, I mean, those are metaphors. I'm not in international relations, so I'm sure you have different ways of understanding them, but um, I'm from literary studies, and I see metaphors are definitely real. Senses, so I don't really see them as um, outside of something that we use in our daily life and that we experience materially. But I just want to say something about your um, the, the under determination problem. What do you think if um, the, the ideas of quantum mechanics are sort of used? And I'm sorry to say the word used in such an abstractivist kind of way. Um, if we see, for example, Something. If we see a, a Newtonian ontology that's quite materialist, that sees things as dead in a rhetoric way, but then that manifests in a very political and very real way for people in their lives, and we want to use the ideas of someone like Barrett to intervene in those in another very real way, even though the, though the quantum ideas are undetermined, what do you think of using those to intervene in something that is metaphorical but also real and probably quite materialist? Wow, there's a lot there. So I don't know that I, I feel like I shouldn't be the one answering that. But I'm, my own take is I think what Karen, a, lot, a lot of Karen Brad's ideas are really productive, whatever they are, metaphor or not. And I don't have any problem with that. I mean, I think, you know, there are other places we can go for figuring out right and wrong that are not physics. Um, so <laughs> that would be my, my really, really short answer to your much deeper question. <laughs> it was a problem. Well, can I just, yeah. Did you want to rip on that? Okay, go ahead. Not respond. I don't think that the, the issue is whether metaphors are real or not, are important or not. Anyone, many of us, here, not everyone, study politics and metaphors in politics is the essence, just watch the news these days. Uh, but the point is, if, if somebody, uh, like Alex Cook, for example, makes the claim that we can use quantum theory as is to go beyond the, the realm of physics and apply it to explain consciousness and other uh, phenomena in life. That's, I think, from what I see, that's the, the question. And you can use that as a metaphor, that's perfect. You can draw analogies, that's fine. But if you make the claim that you can use it as this to explain consciousness or other uh, phenomena, then there is a question there that I think we are debating. Yeah. That's how I understood it. I mean, but I would say, so I, I might not be articulating quite well enough, but I, I don't know what it would mean to use it as is. Um, so, so I just, like, I don't understand that the, I mean, that, that's part of the reason that was driving me to try to taxonomize this a little bit, is I just don't, um, I don't understand the claim, because, because we have kind of, and this is an artificial separation, but we, we've got empirical results, we've got equations, we've got concepts, where is, where is it? You know, and, and if it's the equations, fine, you know, the equations are equations, um, but if it's a concept, which, how are we doing that? And, and, you know, to, to say it more sharply, um, it's a lovely idea that we're that humans are walking wave functions, but I can't tell you what a wave function is in physics, so I can't understand what that would mean. Um, and, and the fact that I can't say what that is in physics, I think, is a serious issue for this for pursuing that. Right. Yeah. I just thought I wanted to riff on Nora's point too. The, I guess the way I heard your point, Nora, was that um, that classical thinking is deeply inscribed in the social world already at all kinds of levels. And it's a power structure that excludes all kinds of ways of thinking. You know, if you say this, that's irrational, that's stupid, that's not scientific, or whatever. And so your project is a subversive project. It's a critical project, really, 
which is, you know, whatever quantum theory means, it can certainly blast the hell out yes. of an Newtonian view of social life, right? right? And so, um, and if that's not on your list, though, I think it, things you can do. No, I think it is. Well, I, I'm not sure. I actually think that that's probably in applying concepts um, as models discursively, not necessarily quantitatively. Um, but again, I'm just trying to make the point that that's not, I mean, and I'm trying to make a point that I think supports the act um, because, because I think those concepts are really important. And I'm trying to basically say, though, that I don't think we should look to physicists to necessarily give the authoritative description of what those concepts mean. Like, we can talk about what they mean in our context, but they can, we shouldn't think that physicists have that worked out, basically. Hang on, though, because there was, like, other questions yeah, back over here that I missed. Story. Yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I really liked your uh, taxonomy. I found that very useful. Um, I, I was thinking, because I'm an applied mathematician by training, I was just wondering what would happen if you took it up another level to uh, to mathematics. You know, because uh, in in some of these, it's um, applying equations to a, a new reference set. But these, a, a lot of these equations that are being applied are things that were developed independently. You know, as, as mathematical tools. Right. And so something like, you know, a, a Hilbert equation, this kind of, kind of thing, found applications in, in quantum physics. But um, I think it's, it's possible to, so when we, when we apply those things to, to other areas, there's sort of, there's the comparison with quantum physics, because that's the thing that sort of, you know, is people are most familiar with. But it's not really to, I think it makes just as much sense, and in some cases, Probably historically, you might even be able to look at it the other way, like you know, tools that work well in, in, in the social sphere or something like that could kind of go the other way. So, yeah. Um, and I, I think you know, one thing about physics in general is that um, sometimes there's a, a you know, a bit of a, a, a tendency uh, to see the equations as being real, like in, in physics as well. And so that sort of underlies a lot of you know, like the quest for a theory of everything. You know, sure. Yeah. Right. Some set of equations that you know you write on a T-shirt and tells you what the, what the universe is, right? And so, um, from a but from a uh, sort of a, you know modeling point of view, it would be like you know a set of equations is just a tool that that works and they work splendidly. I mean, as you said earlier, yeah. they have amazing predictive success in other areas, in, yeah. in some areas, in other areas they have much less predictive success. So it's kind of but you know there's sort of a tool that's out there that you can use. Yes. So, um, right. So, um, to your, I, I think there are sort of two points that are in, in comments I want to make on both of them. Uh, that, um, in a sense, like there's no reason to, you know, when you're taking Hilbert space mathematics and doing some sort of probabilities, it's just history that we call that quantum math. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily need, you know, it's, it's associated with it's, it's math. Um, but to the, but I think there's some personally just some really interesting questions to be asked about our, um, about the. The way that mathematics is relating to structures in the universe, and about our expectations as physicists about what that should look like. I think the aesthetic criteria of Occam's razor and the seeking beauty um, are something we should be seeking. And exactly those sorts of ideas about like believing in power of the equations is something we should be um, interrogating personally. So just to, just to follow up, I think one thing is that um, you know the spirit of the in, in the social sciences, they you know the, the way of applying them. Like one, one problem with applying these quantum ideas is that you sort of have this thing hanging over your your, your shoulder, you know, which is that you're, you're copying this other thing. But it'd be nice if you could kind of have more of the approach that the early quantum physicists had, which was that what they were trying to do was they had data which uh, they could not explain, you know, using the classical formulas. And the only thing that made sense was a classical was a was a quantum approach, and they they didn't want. It. Right. I mean, you know, it was, it yeah. was, uh, it was, it was uh, and they were trying to kind of get rid of it at first, right? But it wouldn't go away. Yeah. And and I think in a way, that's kind of the approach is that you, you model uh, a, a system as if it obeys these rules which you made up. And if it works, then that's great, yeah. you know? But it doesn't, in the end, the system model is wrong. Right, and it doesn't it's really, perfect. it's not given to us by physics necessarily. Yeah, it didn't kind of come out of the sky. Yeah. So. There was, I, I, there was some other uh, so you said, you began this by saying that uh, if you get a couple physicists and ask them to explain a concept and work up and understand, they won't be able to, which, which I agree with. 
I've always associated that with the inadequacy of words. So that's not bothering me. Um, <laughs> maybe the wrong like, audience, but for me personally, that's I, I don't expect words to be better than that, so it doesn't bother me. Um, I'm trying to understand if you think it goes deeper than that. So, uh, for example, um, I've had many long conversations through the night, as all physicists have, as to the two slit experiment and, and this and the other thing. But when it comes time to predicting what an electron will do, I've never known anyone personally to have trouble with how to do that prediction. The things that come, the, the ambiguities that come into the conversation go away when we actually try and make a prediction. Is that consistent with what you see? I think so, yeah. The ambiguities do go away when we make the prediction. It's when we try to, but but I, I, you know, I think there's more, again, more to it, slightly more to it than language in that, um, yes, language is sloppy. Um, but it's, we can't visualize this either. Um, so it breaks down there. But we wouldn't. I mean, that's a you know that's a question. Sure. Who are we, who are we to tell the universe what to write? What I'm, it should do, or, or, with or how it should connect with us? But I but I think it is just especially in these kind of idea translational um, contexts. It's, I think it is important to note that we are working with with phenomena that are um, that really defy verbal and visual representation. I think in you know a pretty significant way. My my experience has been that in the physics community that's okay. The physics community is huge, and all of us want to see a part of it. So we can get into a scenario here where we got the, the proverbial elephant, yes. and one blind person, I'm on the tail and you're on the front. But my own experience has been I've never known anyone, when I've had these kinds of conversations, that would find that idea controversial. No. Oh. Right. I don't, no, I don't think so either. OK, I just, I just wanted to. I mean, in physics, I think we are comfortable somehow just sort of giving up on certain types of knowledge. I wouldn't say that we give up because that's why we have these frustrating conversations for so long into the night. We keep trying. <laughs> but we don't necessarily associate the failure to have that conversation with the failure of physics. Yeah. Well, some people do. Okay. Anyway, yes. Thanks. First of all, I, I thought the taxonomy was very interesting, very illuminating. But I'm kind of wondering whether, in a sense, you're, um, you're sort of exaggerating the extent to which this is a problem unique to quantum mechanics. Because uh, it would seem to me that um, this is true of, of science in general, and it's even true of classical mechanics. There were multiple, I mean, so the point is what you're kind of doing is drawing a very sharp line uh, between the science and the ontology behind the science. And, and the fact that, that there are many different possible ontologies you could read off the science means it's underdetermined, and the only thing you have at the end of the equations and the observations. That's true for any science, frankly, right? The, whole, the history of science is full of that, right? I mean, you think about evolutionary biology, okay? I mean, there, it, again, you have the same phenomena where, where you, know, it, you know, scientists want to make a fairly strong distinction between what is properly scientific and then all the ontological assumptions and conclusions one might draw, because, of course, those could go in many kinds of directions, which then spill over into all kinds of fields, right? Yeah. But that's been very common in the, in the history of science, and in fact, classical mechanics had the same sort of issue. So, you know, we, were, we heard earlier that supposedly classical mechanics believed in this materialist worldview. What was the nature of this materialism? There were many different versions of materialism. Some atomistic, some non-atomistic, some energetic, and, and, you know, energeticists, you know, and as you get closer and closer in time, it moves in many directions, and they start retreating more and more to this business of just looking at the equations, just looking at the observations until they can go no further, and then they're forced to move into you know, the relativity and the 20th century physics. But generally speaking, this kind of issue you're drawing attention to is just natural in science. I There's never that. ontological uh, unity. I, I think probably that's true. I think I would probably agree with you. I mean, it's, <coughs> I, think, I think maybe it's just become more obvious that that's the case. When we I mean, the point you're them. making about quantum mechanics, which I think is the thing that tries to give your argument the edge, is that you lean on this idea that quantum phenomena are somehow, at some basic level, unintelligible, or, right? In other words, more unintelligible. So in other words, we don't even have clear alternative models. Well, we do and have think, clear. Alter we, have, we have another clear alternative model, but we have no, um, no clear basis to pick them. 
Okay, well that's a different matter because there has been because people have made claims in the past that there was something fundamentally unintelligible about quantum mechanics that made it different. So it wasn't just a, a, a matter of competing models that we couldn't decide between, but that we really couldn't even get a model straight in our mind. Right. I appreciate your point. I think that is definitely the direction that I, mean, I, I want to think more about. But I, um, one thing I want to, to note is just based on the equation. If I take a classical equation, I can label, I mean, so this will break down if you dig deeply into it, but I, I would argue that for a long time physicists worked as if we could simply label what the things in that equation are, that the reference were well defined. And it really isn't true. You're absolutely right. If you take down, what in the world is momentum? Like, yeah. what? So it's not actually true in a classical sense either, but we certainly behaved as if that was the case. And I would, I would say there's something like, Maybe we just learned something about the relationship between physics and ontology when we hit the quantum era and we have something in the equation, that being a wave function that nobody really agrees with. I, I feel like I'm taking too much time. Let's give more, more minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead here. So the, you use the concept of practice quite often. And I wonder, behind it, is behind it some understanding that tacit knowledge is different? other kind of knowledge? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know. Why did you use the concept? Of practice? Yeah. Um, probably because I work at an art school and talking about practices is all anyone does. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be completely honest with you, it's just like changed my vocabulary for talking about this. Um, but because I think, um, right, I mean, so how do you express what is physics? Right? There's, the, there's a cumulative body of, of facts that we acquire, empirical facts, and there's a, there's a cumulative model building process that we take place in. But then there's all this other stuff, which is all really relevant for that. And I don't think you can fully separate it, but that's where, that's, I guess, why, why, uh, why I want to talk about it. Because it's certainly like, yes, you know, the con like a thought about entanglement may very much motivate what you do in a lab to study entanglement, like the concept of entanglement might motivate that. But then I still think at the end of the day when where we, where we cum cumulatively move forward in physics is with the equations and the needs required and the cumulative empirical information. I don't know. But in science and technology studies, this is where the, the knowledge, the epistemic knowledge yeah. or the rational knowledge, they say is in fact embedded in this other set of knowledge. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're saying the coordinates of the first really cannot really decide without understanding the second. Absolutely. But then we then that makes it much like even a weirder set of layers when we talk about what do you do when you take some knowledge from physics and yes. use it elsewhere. What is right. you talking mm -hmm. about with the knowledge right. and what would it mean to take the practice of? Yeah. I think I don't know where it was going to Well, actually, let's spread it around as much as we can. Yeah. Um, Yes. I guess I, I did find your comment about the, the reference thing uh, and the equation really precise. Because uh, I think, I guess, my feeling is that is there something here going on in terms of intuition and common sense, right? Like, uh, we've always been ontologically unsure about the implications of the different theories. You could draw a long running philosophical debate about what exactly is causality and is the thing that I'm observing actually causing that. But I do wonder whether there's some level where uh, our reasoning and our findings about quantum physics are just intuitively non-consensical in terms of how we live our, our, our lives mm -hmm. and sort of right. observe yeah. certain things, right? Like, if we come up with a with Newton's theories, there's at least some baseline of common sense and intuition yeah. that we see yeah. about stars and apples and how the universe works, which just seems to break down quantum, uh, and yeah. at which point our ontological claims become mm -hmm. really, really common if we don't have that baseline of common sense. I very much agree with that point. I mean, I, the title of the symposium that I had a month ago in the arts context is quantum unlearning because I think in a lot of ways that's what we do when we engage with quantum physics is unlearn a lot of our naive conceptions. And I don't think the naive conceptions like don't come from anywhere. We build those through our bodily interaction with the world starting as infants. But I've often wondered myself, you know, as a mother, um, you know, an infant um, does not know that they're separate from you. Um, they don't know sep they don't know physical separation. They don't know um, object permanence. They don't know any of these things. We we build up those things, and it, it is quite difficult then to hit quantum physics, which tells us that those things, that the intuitions we have about things, um, don't hold on every scale. Can I just riff on make a point about that though? Because I, 
I mean, I think that the idea that Newtonian model is commonsensical, like we're talking about chairs and tables, that makes perfect sense, right? But if we're talking about interactions of people, I mean, if, I think if social science were being founded today and we looked at physics for help, we would never look to classical physics. It's obvious we would look to quantum physics because that's clearly intuitively much more commonsensical for social scientists, I think, than this mechanical, deterministic world of planets and billiard balls, which is kind of crazy. That's counterintuitive. But that's, it's, I'm sorry? It's a mismatch. It's a mismatch, yeah. So I think it's, you know, I, I'm persuaded that it's not commonsensical, actually. I would just want to add that that common sense was ingrained in people over several centuries yes. based on new and common so right. It's common sense only because we have it this cultural yeah. moment and this cultural sense. That's true. I mean, if we were working in a, in a cultural context which had, um, I mean, taking English as our, our language, um, of the common language here, that had a different, you know, not just yes and no, but yes, no, and in between, and both yes and no, and, you know, a bunch of other concepts. And vertexes, and yeah. the ectics, all kinds of yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. You're nodding your head as Alice was talking, but he made two separate points. We mm -hmm. wouldn't look to Newtonian physics, yes. Do you think we would naturally then look to quantum physics? No. <laughs> well, we do. <laughs> Why are you looking to physics? <laughs> I mean, I think these, I mean, maybe, like, I, I don't know. Anyway, why are we looking to physics? Queen of the science, or else? Yeah. You, well, you want the authority. This is what I'm trying to say. Like, stop looking. We don't want have truth. It. We want, I want <laughs> truth, not authority. Well, I think the answer is that physics has provided since Newton and that all era a immense transformation of our world, yes. much of which we yes. like and enjoy. So it's not as if this is just one random thing picked out of the air. It's something that's produced a whole society. And it's not unreasonable to think that physics, by studying like physical reality, should tell you about physical reality. Like, that, that does make sense. But it's serious that it's like that it hasn't really worked. It does follow from a certain point in that there are lots of other sciences which are really good at describing life. Yes. And so, in fact, much better at describing life than physics. So, right, you could just as easily look at complexity theory. But they don't know what life. The biologists don't know what life is. Well, they. Can I don't think they talk about. about our, they they talk can, about. They can it. give you a similar set of, of concepts. Uh, but the other question is like already the history that you're going to want to look to a science. Right? I mean, look at Bohr and Heisenberg's notebooks. They're looking at Heidegger. They're fighting about Kant and Nietzsche. They're talking about metaphor. So why, right? Why not reach, right, to philosophy? Like, why is the assumption that we would reach to a science if we were to start social science over today? Well, I mean, in my book, obviously, there's a lot of philosophy. No, I, I know, I know. So, I'm just saying. I guess the physics is there because otherwise, to my mind, all the social science and the social concepts don't have a physical grounding, and everything has to be physical. I mean, I assume that everybody agrees that everything is physical in some sense, right? I'm happy with your... Many philosophers agree yeah. with that, too, right? I'm sorry? Many philosophy agree. Yes, yes. yes. Although they think physical. physical as a means classical material. Yeah. Okay, so right. here's my question. I, I want to get back to... You responded to her about this question of explanation, which came up, and you said it blows it all away. Um, I want to know the grounds of blowing it all away, because I don't think you all are actually going to agree uh, so, you think that quantum physics blows it all away, and I hear explanation. So, it gives us these metaphors and these concepts we can use to sort of negate uh, right, classical wow. physics. But I, your, your book goes much further than that. You're saying that actually the empirical outcomes blow it away, which is not the same thing as understanding. In fact, if she's right, uh, we don't need understanding for empiricism to change how we think. In fact, we can punt on understanding altogether and just let the data uh, do the work. So which one are you, where are you positioning? Well, my initial comment was really just the weaker comment that it blows it away in the sense that you can't just take for granted that the world, okay. the social world, is an Antonian mechanical Because world. it makes sense, meaning understanding and satisfaction, or because of the empirical predictive character of it? I think, I guess I would say both. Conceptually, it doesn't. I mean, to me, it's very counterintuitive to think about social life as planets smashing each other. That just doesn't. Yeah. I'm alive. I'm not a planet. You know, I'm, I'm not a zombie. Um, but planets are like. I'm sorry. Planets are like. Well, planets are quantum too. Planets are alive. planets. Oh, I don't know about planets. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're very good panpsychists. <laughs> well, actually, actually, the panpsychism has to eliminate <coughs> stuff like planets. That's actually part of the move. But anyway, I'm talking too much here, so let's look at I just think the, this debate about what science and what type of physics a social science would have to um, make appeals to to ground itself, that just strikes me as being kind of outdated. 
uh, in many important sense. That, leaving aside your question of you, you think it's obligatory upon us to do it, but if we just looked at the practice of social, most social scientists today, say political scientists in a early 21st century program, you'd learn the Rubin causal model, you would learn how to identify causal inferences, and you would go forward. And maybe you would scale up to certain concepts and you would argue about the ontology of what they were, or maybe you wouldn't. But you know, I, I've, been, I've been teaching the Gateway Total Science course for 15 years in a doctoral program. We never make reference to any physics or any other sciences as having to ground us. Now, you want to go one step further and say, that's an awfully large mistake. Well, I guess I want to suggest, why is it that when we teach our grad students methods, we don't even mention for such something called quantum probability theory? They never even heard of it. Okay? So the, the, the hegemony of the classical model is so deep that students are taught there's only one way to do things. And if they were taught both methods, they could choose, and then we could actually figure out which one is empirically maybe more predictive and so on. So I just want to open up the space and say, oh, by the way, there's another way to think about logic, rationality, probability, all this stuff that has been ignored by social science completely. Um, I'm not sure what the justification for ignoring it is. Save that. I'll save my response. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we might want to move forward. Okay. So you want to take one more question? Uh, I'm willing to. All right, one, one, one more. more. One more. I, I just had a question about how this applies to your, like, how you handle this at the art college, and, and how, <laughs> I, which of, you know, which of these sort of apply in, in art, and how people pick up on it is like in time. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, number five is where it's at. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, I, I mean, I would characterize um, the art space as a scholarly space as being intentionally undisciplined, um, and that's, like, that's, that's a lot of fun. So the, the hard job that I have in that context is to try to not fall into um, the scams and fallacies, um, try to carve that out while still leaving space for the rest. I don't know if that addresses your question. On some of us are visually challenged, you and we were sort of guessing. I'm so sorry. Could, <laughs> could we put the we can put summary on. slide at least the list onto the conference slide? Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, can we do that? Put the. Oh, yeah. well, no, you don't have to get out anywhere. Oh. <laughs> you weren't paying attention. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> we want to know if we can put this slide somewhere on in box. So that oh, absolutely. Can, yeah. Everything we posted on box was done. The conference is over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. As long as you have permission. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Is the box on the actual version website, or is it distributed? So how is, um, how is Box? Mm -hmm. So you, everyone who uses Box, you'll get a link, but you have to be invited to that box. So it's mm -hmm. not open to the public, because a lot of folks don't want to share it right. widely. So. But everybody who's part of the program should be connected. If you're not, then there was probably a glitch, or you got left off or something. So okay. Okay. Shoot so me an email. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. sure. okay. All right. Well, thank you, Catherine. Who's going to go first? Um, okay. So this is Badri Nakh Bharti. I've known him actually quite a long time, and he is a physicist and a political scientist by training. PhDs in both. He's the first quantum political scientist I think ever, to my knowledge. He's been talking about this stuff for 20 years, um, and at uh, Florida, and you know, I'm not sure what your title is anymore. I think you've changed the title since the last one I saw. So yes, indeed. Um, first, should I use the microphone? Or can you hear me? Yeah, can you? That's already. The mic works. Oh, okay. Good. Um, well, s since I submitted my my title and abstract and. Um, my mind changed, basically. Uh, although I have part of that paper written, uh, what I thought originally was to build a toy model, as physicists call it, and then see where it can get, where it can get me with uh, what I called then the topological quantum field theory, whether I can come up with uh, some good understanding of power relations in, in uh, international relations. But as I was working on that, I was hit by a number of questions. Uh, foundational questions and it stopped me right there. So instead I, I moved into thinking about what I call now quantum theory and the construction of the foundations of a new social theory. So that's the, the broad theme that I've been thinking with. 
And then uh, listening to, uh, to Kathleen and, and uh, Michael, uh, it gave me more, more uh, confidence in my uh, self-doubt. Uh, basically, uh, the issue I've been thinking about for many months now is, first, let me say that I agree with the general essence of Alex's book, which is the question, is it possible to uh, take quantum theory beyond, as, as a mathematical theory, and I underline this and I come back to this, as a mathematical theory to explain other phenomena such as social, the social phenomena or others. Um, so basically the idea, is it possible to use quantum theory as a mathematical theory without doing three things, without translation, without using it as a source of uh, metaphors and without using it as, uh, as, uh, to make analogies. So I'd like to avoid these three things, translation, analogies, and metaphors. Well, in order to do that, I asked myself, what is the quantum really? As, as a mathematical theory, I'm not talking about the experiments of physics. So we have to be clear about that. I'm not talking about the double slit experiment or entanglement as an experiment or I'm talking about the mathematical theory of quantum physics. So what is it? What makes quantum as quantum? What makes it as a, mathemat as a mathematical theory? And then I bumped into a very interesting set of articles and a book by uh, Elias Zafiris and uh, Michael Epperson, where they read this book, uh, published in uh, 2014. Uh, the book is split into two parts. 50% uh, of the book is pure philosophical by Epperson. The other 50% is by Zafiris, uh, quite mathematical. He's offering basically a new approach to quantum theory as a mathematic the mathematics theory. And the idea he uses is what's called nowadays uh, constructive mathematics based on the approach called category, category theory. Category theory has created a revolution in mathematics in the sense that it, for the last uh, 40, 50 years, many mathematicians, uh, obviously, as you should expect, there's no unanimous agreement, obviously, human beings, but many mathematicians have been trying to recast mathematics using category theory as a replacement for set theory. The theory of sets created a revolution in streamlining, in, in, uh, in, uh, in making mathematics as much more rigorous way to solve the old paradoxes that were raised by Russell and the others back in the early 20th century. So they came up with a set theory with different versions, so on and so forth. It provided a very solid anchor for mathematics. Now, in the 1940s, 50s, and more in the 60s, uh, people started thinking about this category theory what makes it interesting to me, as uh, someone is thinking more about social life now, is the fact that it is based on relations. Well, they call it morphisms, but it's relations. And you take a, a set, for example, you have elements of a set, you have the operation of inclusion, and you have subsets, and so on and so forth, and then you have an algebra, usually it's the Boolean algebra, and so on and so forth. Well, category theory, you need objects, any object, you need relations among these objects, called morphisms, you need a law of composition of these relations, and then you need, uh, basically, a, a law of self-identity, an object is related to itself. Using these very rudimentary concepts, and diagrams, you can basically recast a lot of different mathematical theories, including quantum theory, and that's what the theories have been doing for the last 10 years or so. And then I found myself asking myself, is it possible, instead of using equations, whether it's Schrodinger or operators or any other formulation of quantum theory, and by the way, I'd like to point out that uh, what we usually call interpretations of quantum phenomena or quantum theory are not interpretation in the sense that we use it in social theory or philosophy. It means different formulations of the theory, different mathematical formulations uh, of the theory. Uh, that aside, so is it possible to use category theory to reformulate quantum theory? This is what many people are doing in quantum theory. 
Now, what's interesting about category theory is that it's so abstract, then you can apply it to model, for example, any phenomenon you're interested in, including societies, including consciousness, including anything. It's so abstract. It has no uh, ontological content to it. Uh, you, if you'd like to apply it to ontology as Alain Badiou has done, for example, in his books, The Logics of the World, you can do it, but you don't have to. You don't have to. You can use it as a mathematical framework to model whatever phenomenon or theoretical question you have on your mind. So I found myself asking, well, can I do the same thing for, for example, international relations? I've been interested in the issue of the global versus the local, how to connect the two, for example. Can I use abstract theory in order to do that? Well, the simple answer, which doesn't mean necessarily that I, I, I'm doing it now, but yes, in principle it's possible. I can define my objects, I can define my relations, and then I can use a lot of different theorems and, 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 uh, and, and lemmas and other uh, mathematical uh, results from category theory, and I can play with it, just like Alan Badiou has played with it in demonstrating that uh, mathematics is the best ontology, of the, 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 the first ontology, but I don't have to do that. So the question then is, is this a translation or not? Well, the simple answer, it is not. It is not a translation. I'm creating from scratch objects that I'm using in my categorical theory, category theory uh, uh, of, of uh, let's say, international relations, and working with it and see where it takes me. Where is the quantum in here? Well, that's the big question. There is no quantum as is, at least it is first stage. So I found myself going back to quantum theory expressed in a categorical framework. Categ usually they say categorial to avoid the uh, Kantian connotations. So they say categorical uh, theory. And I tried to find what makes quantum quantum within categorical uh, category theory, and I found one basic result that uh, Zafiris, for example, uses in his book, which is the way you understand a measurement in an experiment, uh, how do you theorize that? How do you conceptually theorize the operation of uh, measurements? Usually physicists do it using uh, projectors and projection operators and so on and so forth. But to him, it has to be more basic than that. He uses the concept of algebra. And he makes the argument that, for example, what you, when you are undergoing an experiment, you are still within the classical world. So you are doing the experiment, you are preparing the, the, the material, the, the devices. So you're living in the, in, the, in the classical world. So to him, how is it then you go from this to observing the quantum phenomena, which is clearly not classical, at least within the, the usual definition of the separation between quantum and, and classical. So he comes up with this uh, topological argument. Now, my take on this is that it is possible to do the same thing within social theory, but one has to be careful. What is topology? Topology usually understood is uh, when we are interested in um, how, for example, a, uh, a donut becomes a coffee mug. How? Well, according to topological theory, basically you deform without any ruptures, without any uh, uh, cuts, and then you can get from a donut to a coffee mug, and it's perfect. Why? Because topology is not interested in, in the metrics, in distances, in angles, as long as you don't break anything, just like you have a rubber band and you can basically do with it whatever you want to do, and, and as long as you don't break it. That's what topology is interested about. Now, in category theory, that's not the topology that they are interested in. They redefine topology by using the same concepts, which is relations. It becomes 100% relational topology. It's not based anymore on sets. It's not based on uh, a space, it's based on relations. It's, of course, it's a very complicated uh, way of, of doing it, but the, 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 the outcome is that using such a notion of 
relational topology, you can show clearly how the local builds the global without relying on anything else. And I found this very appealing for me. Why? Because uh, I'm not using any metaphors, any doing any analogies or anything. I'm demonstrating from first principles, if you will, from scratch, that I can relate the local to the global by topological arguments. Usually it's called abstract topology in the literature or algebraic topology. That's the name uh, the mathematicians use for it. But it, again, it's so abstract as, as, as a mathematical tool, you can apply it to anything, basically, as, as long as you are able to define the relations among whatever objects that you are interested in. And the objects do not pre-exist relations. So uh, in the book that I mentioned earlier, for example, they offer what they call relational realism. And they even go back as far as uh, Whitehead, the process and reality, and they build on that to give some philosophical uh, underpinning to their arguments. But the real argument is really mathematical. They rely on what's called constructive mathematics. Another uh, consequence of using category theory is that, well, you end up with a logic that is not Boolean or an algebra, if you will, that is not Boolean. And it's what's called intuit, intuit, intuition, intuitionistic, intuitionistic uh, algebra or logic. And the main issue here, if you remember the, uh, the principles of Aristotle logic, the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle, well, when you work with category theory, you end up losing uh, the law of the excluded middle which means basically it's not to be or not to be. No, something can be in between. To be or not to be, but also it can be in between. So that law is broken. It doesn't work anymore. And this is very interesting for quantum physics because long time ago, uh, von Neumann and Birkhoff, they showed in the 1930s that what they called then quantum logics do violate Boolean logic. They do violate Boolean logic. So it works well, at least historically speaking. Obviously, quantum logics didn't work well because there were many problems with them, and physicists are still trying to, uh, to go beyond those limitations. So it doesn't work really well. It's an open-ended question. But in category theory, where you basically uh, throw away the, the loft excluded middle, it's a very powerful tool. But at the same time, it leads to uh, what's called constructive mathematics, which is basically, for example, in, in, in demonstrating a result in mathematics, usually you can use what's called the reasoning by the absurd, which is, I can't remember the Latin term for it, but instead of showing that something is true, you show that the opposite is wrong. And then you deduce that it's true. And what what allows you to do that is because you are implicitly relying on the law of the excluded middle. You have either this or that, true or false. So if you show that this is not valid, then automatically you're showing that this is good. Well, if you throw away the law of the excluded middle, it doesn't work anymore. So it's called constructive mathematics because every time you have to construct your argument, you cannot rely on the other side to show that it's valid, whatever argument you're making. And this is then very powerful because there is a very famous theorem in uh, quantum physics by um, Cochin and Specker. Am I pronouncing it right? Cochin or Co Cochin? Cochin. Cochin and Specker, which says that, well, if you're trying to, for example, go from the global level in quantum mechanics to the local, well, the local, you can always assume, for example, a Boolean logic or whatever, but the global is not really, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence. Boolean logic is violated at the global level. Well, in using category theory, this works well because the excluded middle is working well. So all of this then convinced me that what we need, if we are to avoid translating avoid analogies and metaphors, we can, in principle at least, work out a category theory of social theory based on what we are used to, relations among actors or human beings or whatever, and then 
That's the first shift. The second shift, we have to engage what I like to call a shift in concepts by relying on topology rather than, again, assuming a classical way of thinking about concepts. Uh, for example, um, Michael discussed a lot about uh, how we can go from classical probability to quantum probability. Well, I always tell my, uh, I teach statistics to graduate students, uh, but I always tell them that, you know what, we're assuming a lot when we think about probabilities this way. For example, we're assuming that, well, when you do your hypothesis testing, you try to reject the null hypothesis and you're happy with it. What if there are more than just two choices? What if the set of choices is not closed? It's open. What if? And then sometimes they tell them about quantum probability. They try to enlarge their, their field of interest and, and questioning. But the point is, if you were to use a topological approach to conceptualization, then notions of metrics, notions of sets, notions of distances, of angles, are not needed anymore. And it looks so intuitive when we try to conceptualize about the human behavior, for example, or societies, or social phenomena, political phenomena, using a metric distance to measure, for example, the distance between actors, it looks too artificial. Whereas using a concept that is topological looks much more intuitive. That's one. And second, using a, a, uh, a way of thinking about human behavior or actions, whatever you're interested in, by excluding or rejecting the law of the excluded middle makes a lot of sense. Do you like coffee? Both. I like it and I hate it at the same time. I'm in the middle. I never personally do surveys because I don't like to categorize myself. Uh, you have this or that or that. You have categories and in between is not allowed. Well, if you think using the excluded, the, 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 the law of the, if you reject the law of the excluded middle, then you should be able to do otherwise, to think otherwise. So what is the, uh, the point here? Well, responding to you a little bit, not responding or building on your, on your discussion, uh, applying equations, these are the notes I took, maybe that's not exactly what you said, but applying equations to other reference is basically doing physics. That's what you said? Yeah, 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 beyond, beyond the original reference. Yes. Yes. Then, then well, my, 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 re my reply is I can do that if I rewrite what is quantum theory in the sense of abstract or a category theory because it's at such an abstract level that there's no connection to the reference. And this speaks to the earlier issue that you raised about applied mathematics. So because there is no necessary uh, connection between the mathematical theory and the referent object, then nothing prevents me from using it elsewhere. Um, to be skeptical to take physics concepts to more than just metaphors, I agree with you 100% because I don't need metaphors. I can build a categorical theoretic theory of social theory without using metaphors because those concepts are already in social life, relations. We always talk about relations. So I'm not inventing anything new. Ordinary language is always built into the, the, the framework and therefore, and this is by the way, the only primitive, if I can use, or let's say metaphysical or whatever, primitive that is built into category theory, the notion of relations. From there, you build everything else. So there's no need for translation or borrowing or metaphors or making any analogies. Um, You've got about 10 minutes left. Already... Yeah, yeah, I was about to say, I am done, and I welcome your, 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 your questions. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I really enjoyed that talk. Uh, Thank you. I didn't know anything about this, so uh, I just learned a lot. Uh, let me ask this question. If uh, constructivist mathematics can, can do all this, and that sounds very exciting, 
why the need to call it quantum mechanical? It seems like it's analogous to quantum mechanics, but it's its own animal separate from quantum mechanics. That just happens to be similar in some ways. Uh, first, I don't call it quantum mechanical. Oh, I misunderstood. No, I call it categorical, categorical theoretic. And the point is, is whether there are certain, this is, the, I think I didn't mention this well. I'm trying to see whether in quantum theory, for example, recast using category theory, where there are some results that can be, uh, be applied elsewhere, such as in social theory, because they're expressed in such an abstract way. Is there anything there that I can be used elsewhere in social theory or in chemistry or anywhere else. The, the beauty of category theory, it's so abstract, its results are universal to any object in any field of knowledge. And that's the only place where I can see the connection between quantum theory expressed in a categorical theoretic framework and social theory. Is it clear what I mean? Very clear. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the, the first question, um, the reason I, I, let me rephrase what I, let me summarize what I said uh, for the last 15 minutes. I want to come up with a new language, a framework of thinking which is such that it allows me not to be bound with any limitations, whether it's physical or, or else. Is there such a mathematical universal language that can be applied to different reference to different realms of, of, of interest that I can use in social theory, in physics, and elsewhere? That is the main question that people who came up with uh, category theory uh, were asking themselves. And I do believe that it's possible because category theory, it's such an abstract, it allows you to define your primitive concepts the way you want, and then use them. And um, I was looking for <laughs> That's OK. And the way you demonstrate uh, whatever results you want to demonstrate in category theory, use diagrams. You draw diagrams, and you make sure that what they call they commute. It's, anybody can learn that. Even in elementary school, they can do that, as long as they understand what they're doing. So um, that was the first question, right? And the second question? Well, the first question I took to be, what are the relations in social life that you're talking about? I take the point that you can talk about any kind of relations yes. you want. Yes, yes. What are you talking about when you say relations in social life, you mean what? It's up to you. I'm providing you, <laughs> seriously, I'm providing you with framework okay, of analysis, know. and you can define relations in any way you want. Okay. If you're doing quantum physics, you define them in the physics sense. If you're doing international relations and you're just, for example, in the balance of power, you define, as long as you follow the mechanics and the rules of category theory, you will be using a category of a theoretic framework. That's, uh, yes. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Enjoyed okay. it. Um, my question has to do with what happens to the subject in this, like the human being that's doing the positing. So in terms of, a, of the relational standpoint of the subject. So for Heisenberg, quantum theory wasn't a language that actually found things out there. It was just the language that we set to nature. So it was really nature's only answering perspective that we were projecting outwards. That's why Heisenberg always writes, uh, you always come back to the subject. 
right? Arendt takes that and talks about how, well, yeah, you can never jump over your own shadow. So in this, wh what happens to that individual that's doing the depositing? Uh, nothing happened to the individual, to the subject, because tell me how you define the subject, and I'll tell you how to redefine the whole, uh, let's say, for example, subject structure relations, and I can tell you how to use category theory in order to think about that. Um, just to, to emphasize the point again, it, this is as if it's working at a meta-analysis level, uh, and it provides you with certain conceptual tools that are so abstract, you can apply them any way you want uh, to the field of interest that you have on your mind. And uh, what it does, it dislodges the supremacy of set theory, which is extremely dominant in our thinking without realizing it. For example, the notion of, of time that we think about is based on set theory. The notion of space, any, any notions that you can think of are usually defined by presupposing the uh, basic operations and the logic of set theory, and this dislodges that. So, um, so my answer to you, and in fact, uh, if you'd like to read uh, Badiou's book, The Logics of the World, he tries to do that. I don't necessarily agree with his conclusions, but he tries to deploy category theory to do that. So, wait, so where does the subjectivity go then? If we take subjectivity as a code or a synonym for consciousness, where does that appear in all this, or is that exogenous? It sounds like that's exogenous. The fact that you are a subject with consciousness and is able to use category theory, mm -hmm. that's all exogenous. I'm not sure I can follow you. Exogenous well, to what? Can your framework endogenize uh -huh. your own subjectivity and explain your own subjectivity, yeah. including your own consciousness? Is that sort of what I was yeah. getting? And I bet it can't. Yeah. Well, well, I bet it can. Be outside your own theory. No, it won't be because you just need to recast your theory about consciousness in categorical uh, theoretic terms, and uh, nothing and prevents that's you from explain, doing that. That's going to explain your consciousness and my consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yes. Over your own shadow. Right. Yeah. 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 I have an, an observation because I think maybe it answers your question. Um, so you're trying to start from a clean slate, right? So you can have a theory that has no a priori. That is what you're trying to do. If I understand correctly. But... Well, the only a priori is relations. You have to have okay. relations, yes. But I think what you presented, you also has a topological approach. And the way you were talking about topological approach, it already presupposes an ontological stance, which is that everything is relational. So, because, and that's how you can talk. You like coffee? Mm, yes. So, it is a relational uh, uh, structure of being, which then maybe you can talk about the subject in relational terms. Oh, Be yeah, yeah. Subject to subject, or subject to space, or time. In other words, you do have something that is a priori in order to be able to create this theory that you want to apply at a very abstract level. Also, the global and the local, right? To uh, reference, reference points. The way we think about them nowadays the globalization is relational. They're not oppositional. So that's my point. The yeah, yeah. Aspect. Yeah, thank you very much. I agree with that. Uh, uh, if you could imagine, which is impossible to me at least, and if uh, in existence without relations, then yes. No, it's not relations. Relational. Yeah, relational. Yeah. Re re relationality. Relationality. Yes.
from the local that is abstract to the local that is very specific. They're not antithetical. They can uh, talk to each other because the relationship is relational. It's not opposition. Well, I, I think I agree with you to a certain extent only in the following sense. Uh, relational doesn't necessarily mean the absence of conflict or the presence of cooperation or anything else. It's just that those relations define whatever objects are in relation. It seems to me, when I was, I was following you, um, as if you are implicitly assuming objects prior to the relations. I'm doing the opposite. I'm assuming that the objects are defined through the relations, and the relations can be anything, can be conflictual, can be cooperative, can be anything. So I'm not making any assumption on that. That's, uh, that's what category theory says, at least. Okay. I yeah. think, I think, well, actually, we're starting to get close. We've got to go a quarter to six. I think we've got to stop and let Yakub take over. So that's all right with you. Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Right. Thank you. Quick word about Jakub. He was a postdoc here. Um, was it a couple years ago? Two years ago. Yeah. And uh, he's a quantum game theorist. Um, does experiments. He's at Charles University. And um, should be good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to present here my work. Uh, after. Yeah, talking after all these guys is really difficult for me as I'm still finishing my PhD uh, program, but I will try to introduce uh, some part of my work when I was uh, trying to apply the quantum models of strategic decision making. And I basically bracketed the question of how it re relates to the reality itself. So my, uh, my point is like pragmatic, pragmatic stance that I am applying these kinds of models and uh, uh, we will see what we can learn from them. So uh, I will apply it to the question of issue of social change and uh, I will introduce quantum model of perspectives interaction and how it relates to the norms dynam dynamics and then I will discuss the added value of the quantum model from my perspective and conclude with some remarks. So as the way of intro introduction, the issue of social change uh, is, is not my claim. This is the claim of, for example, Professor Holsty, Holsty and that main approaches in IR find it di difficult to explain one and when and how the change in existing social structure occurs. I don't want to oversimplify it here, over generalize it, but it basically means that the three main schools uh, are really good to explain like prevailing state of, for example, anarchy or some gradual progress in the liberalism, in liberal tradition, which is but uh, rather a quantitative trend in the qualitative transformation of the IR structure. And yeah, there's a great potential of constructivism to change the social structure by changing the language or uh, discourse, but the real analysis like show the rather the like rigidity of the social structure. And I'm, uh, again, this is not my claim, but you, you can find it, for example, in a Hosty uh, article or a Hosty book. And the question is when and how the qualitative change takes place and if the quantum model of strategic interaction can uh, shed some life on, light on it. And yeah. And uh, I was talking about norms. Um, because the question of change was clearly connected in the literature with the uh, question of norms because they were seen as some kind of like ben bench benchmarks of change or like even the vehicles of system transformation that if we find out new norms that will drive the system that it, it will bring the uh, structural change in the society. And uh, yeah. I'm citing two articles from Holste and Fenomar in Seeking, and in this second article, they presented uh, like the norm life cycle, which I'm building on, and they introduced the first stage as the norms emergence, when uh, like some actors in the society learn to uh, or accept the new norms, and uh, after some tipping point is reached, 
then the norm cascades, so the others will join the early entrepreneurs of the norm, and the last uh, stage for them is some kind of internalization of the norm. So I'm building on this basic structure and uh, trying to interpret it from the perspective I'm sorry, from the perspective of the quantum model. And I add up another kind of uh, evidence from uh, sociology, mainly from the, I don't really, I'm sorry, BG area. <laughs> BG area. Yeah. yeah. And they, from their like, empirical research, the main uh, conclusion is that there are two different expectations that influence our choice to obey a norm. And it is the expectation uh, what the others are to do. It's, they call it empirical expectation and what we believe others think we ought to do, which is the normative expectation. So I draw from it that uh, the empirical expectation, our expectation about the others in the same situation in strategic environment is important for, uh, for our decision making. So uh, putting all these together, uh, uh, we have the norms that can drive the system transformation. Uh, we know that the compliance with the norm depends on the actor expectation of the others. Uh, it means what he or she expects others to do. And uh, the question is uh, if we can uh, like model how the empirical expectation of the others influence agents' uh, behavior. So this is the way of introduction. Then I will try to introduce the quantum model, which is always hard in 10 minutes, <laughs> but I will follow up on the Michael's uh, presentation here, basically. And in my model, I, yeah, I should say that I apply it mainly in my dissertation. I applied it to the presenter's dilemma game, but I would argue that the same logic can be applied to this question. So um, uh, in the, the quantum model, there are two perspectives. I already this, uh, introduced a perspective, which is the agent's inclination toward the possible outcomes, and the other perspective, which is the empirical expectation about the others. And I will agree, argue that uh, th these perspectives are <coughs> complementary variables from the, from the perspective on quant quantum model, which has uh, at least two uh, different uh, con uh, consequences that they are connected via the uncertainty principle. So the higher the certainty in one variable in one perspective, the lower is in the other, and vice versa. And uh, that we cannot measure both perspectives simu simultaneously. So we have to decide it on which order we are measuring them. And so they exhibit all kinds of uh, non-classical effects known from psychology uh, psychological literature like the order effect or interference effect. And it's important to point out that I'm building on like methodological individualism that, uh, that like all my conclusions apply for individual agents in the situation and I uh, see like the structure changes the aggregated effect of these individual choices. And yeah, it's based on the huge literature of Jeremy Buzemeyer, Joyce Wang, and the others. Joyce Wang will be joining us tomorrow, I believe. Uh, so, to introduce the model really quickly, uh, here is the cognitive state of the agent in some strategic environment, and it's the superposition of two options to support the change. Uh, in general view, so any, any kind of change, or to support continuity of the uh, current state. And yeah, it's the way of uh, superposition, so he or she can end up if both, in both <coughs> options, and the quantum model says us the probabilities of both outcomes. And, but we can uh, add another uh, perspective, which is the other perspective, which is the expectation of the others. And in this perspective, we, we saw that uh, it's, again, the superposition of these two outcomes, but the, uh, the projections into these two outcomes is, uh, is different. The probabilities are different. And what I'm doing in the model, I'm trying to explore how, how the other perspective, that means the empirical expectation about the others following the or supporting the change or supporting continuity is influencing the self-perspective. 
And uh, so what's the probability to support change from the uh, agent? Uh, it's given by a orthogonal projection into that outcome. It's squared. So it's, as Michael has presented before that, so I'm not going into this. But there are two other options how to reach supporting change in this, uh, in this way. And one of them is to, this, to consider the others and expect uh, continuity from them and then support change, which is the probability is much lower now. Or there is other option that the agent from its initial cognitive states can go to expecting, supporting change from the others and then supporting change. And what's really important in the quantum uh, probability theory is that uh, these two, these two uh, passes to reach supporting change, the red one and the blue one, uh, do not end up uh, to the same probability as, as direct uh, projection of the initial state. And yeah, the difference between these two altogether and the direct projection into the outcome of supporting change, the difference is the interference effect called in the psychological literature. And I, I don't have time to, uh, to spend too much on it, but if I, it's just it's kind of toy model, then it's only like simple two dimensional on, on about the real numbers, but uh, here you can see the possible size of the interference effect when the, this gray line is the direct projection of the initial state, which is about 25% in this, in this example. And here is the empirical expectation of the others, which goes from zero to one, uh, like uh, the author believing that no, nobody is supporting change and he or she is believing that others will, will follow the change all. And uh, the blue one is the support for change after considering the interference effect. So it could be really huge. It could, in this example, it could go, could go from 25 to 60 something. So uh, it can make really make the difference in the in the so uh, strategic interaction. And how to apply it to the uh, norm dynamics? Uh, okay, uh, let's consider these two. Uh, uh, the three stages from Finemore and uh, I'm sorry <laughs> uh, from Finemore and Seeking article from '98. Uh, yeah, he, I will start with the uh, stage three from the article when the other perspective strengthens the continuity. And uh, here we have the agent, he, uh, and he or she expect others to be more rigid to support continuity because the perspective is more inclined to the initial state. And the most probable path from the initial state to a decision is to expect continuity and then uh, followed by supporting continuity, I'm sorry, from expected continuity and supported continuity is itself. And we, if we aggregated it across all the possible paths, there are four possible paths in this diagram, then considering the other perspective decreases the probability to support change. So whenever the agent uh, considers the others, it significantly uh, decreases his uh, support for, for the change. Yeah. And, I'm sorry. Yeah, here's the animation. <laughs> and uh, what I'm uh, assuming that there is, uh, at some point, there is the change in emp empirical expectation that the others are, ex uh, when others, uh, I'm sorry, when the agent starts to uh, expect others to be more supportive for the change. And it could be, for example, from the wrong assessment of the others regarding the recent events. I, I in my uh, paper, I have the example of the continuity of some kind of political regime, right? Like I'm from Czech Republic, so the uh, continuity of communist regime in 80s when uh, all the, if I'm coming back, then some dis dissatisfied citizen considering supporting the change, some kind of protest, uh, will find himself believing that the others are more, more likely to support continuity or not show up in the streets, basically. 
and so it will uh, significantly inhibit his uh, his choice to support the change. But if he or she uh, sees some uh, recent events as challenging for the attitude of the others, as was, for example, the Gorbachev policy of non-intervention in the affairs of other Warsaw Pact states in 1988, then it could change his empirical expectation about the others. He or she can be wrong still, but it changed the expectation. And then we have this, this two-stage when here the agent believed that the others are more supportive for the change. It can be based on the wrong assessment of the others, but he can still have this other perspective. And here the most probably past, or here the, this perspective significantly support to, yeah, he, he can expect others to support the change and via this option uh, support change itself. And if we aggregate it across all the possible paths, then uh, the interference of the other perspective brings about the higher probability of support change. And yeah, and this was the like stage of the norm em emergence when uh, the agents uh, based on their like individual motives or like assessment of the others can starting uh, supporting the change. But uh, in the case of norm cascade, we need the other perspective to be more like settled to, to really uh, influence all the others. Uh, but now we have like real empirical evidence of the inclination of the others. Because if we have like several uh, supporters of the new norm already, so it, changes, it, it can change the empirical expectation and it will change the empirical expectation. So the other will follow most more easily than, than before that. So if we, yeah, if we make this perspective even greater, it will increase the probability to support the change. And yeah, I'm trying to get on time to not postpone the dinner. But uh, yeah, what I see as the added value, as I said, is the like some kind of toy model when I'm trying to apply the principles of the quantum probability theory to the strategic decision making. And uh, we can argue that this argument that the expectation about the others are prone to change the quantum behavior is nothing new. It's uh, in the literature of, for example, social constructivism. And what is the added value of the quantum model then? And I would argue, I'm sorry, argue that there are three three main dimensions uh, where we can find the added value of this model. And first of all is the like conceptual level when uh, we introduce several new concepts that are like complementary variables, interference effect that are new from the perspective of classical probability theory and in a sense challenge the existing theories as the uh, theory of rational choice or again theory, which I've, I've focused on in my dissertation. And yeah, it can uh, like improve these kind of theories with new concepts, or at least challenge them. <laughs> and uh, from the quantum model, we know several like different types of quantitative predictions, like QQ equation which was derived, I believe, by Jeremy Bzemeyer and Joyce Wang and others, and or the quantum law of recipro reciprocity, which made these models to be testable in the real world. So, for example, in my dissertation, I, I tested this equation, the real data in the real experiment from the game theory, and which is new, because from ex at least from my point of view, the uh, for example, social constructivism offer only qualitative uh, qualitative predictions, uh, not the quantitative one. And the last one, it's, it can inspire our empirical research. I have just one example here I've done recently. When I run the hypothetical check sit poll, uh, asking Czech people about the option to exit the uh, uh, EU, and I found 
real, quite small interference effect, about four four percent in the in, in, it's example of one group of people, like the most influential one. But uh, you can think of it as a really really small interference effect, but it it. Uh, really make a difference because it <laughs> dropped this support for a main from 53.6 to 49.7, which makes it could make difference in the real uh, referendum about the check check it poll if there is this kind of logic. So it can in, in, inspire new kind of empirical research based on the. I would, for example, recommend to. Uh, to research the expectation of people before the election, not only their support of the parties, but also what they expect will be the outcome of the, of the because it can interfere with their choices in the election rooms. And yeah, conclusion, sorry for rushing it up. But uh, yeah, in this paper or in uh, more broadly in my dissertation, I discussed the dynamics of the social norms in the framework of the quantum model and we explore how the expectation about the address, uh, which is the existing norm, are boosting or inhibiting the agent's decision to support a social change and with the use of the simple uh, two-dimensional model, like toy, mo toy model, and the assumption of non-compatibility of this perspective, we had shown that it can explain the main characteristic of the qualitative change in the society just by changing the empirical expectation and uh, yeah and we have seen that it can significantly increase the possibility of agent engaging himself or herself in the social change so that's all thank you I was using as, uh, this as only as an illustration of this model, so I didn't deep uh, into this topic. And uh, like for the real paper, I, I would like to to explore it. So thank you for the for this reference because I I I just wanted to have some examples of the model, and I used in the paper the this uh, like change of political regime and uh, like economic growth and people deciding to enter the, in the industry or, or leave it. So, yeah. Uh, I wonder if something, something strange happens because uh, something new is entering the system at a new perspective. Mm -hmm. And so in your framework, you are working with the already existing perspectives and saying like, how important is, the, uh, is what others think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have two two ways to reply to it. First of all, the the other perspective could be different kind of like question, which is uh, complementary to the self perspective. So it could be different type of, and uh, there are inter there is interesting paper from Christy uh, Kito from Sydney University, I believe. No. I'm not sure if Sydney, but I will uh, check it out. And uh, she's making this claim that you can use the like other perspective of different types, like different arguments to to manipulate the self self perspective. This is the first one, and second one that uh, yeah, the main question for me was uh, in in this contribution was if you don't change your position in the self perspective and only the other perspective change how does it influence if you consider the other perspective in your decision making how does it influence your your choices basically yeah but of course you can 
uh, have the, like some changes in your self-perspective self too, but it's like another part of the problem for me. No, it, it's too good. Yeah. Uh, comparative model uh, evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, you, you listed uh, the benefits of, of, of a, a quantum approach, but if you were go when you're going to go into something like comparing your model to a Tim uh, uh information cascade model, mm -hmm. I mean, before you go into it, you want to establish what your criteria evaluation are. I wonder if you can speak about those a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, beyond conceptual innovation and things like that, when you when you look at it from a quantum game theoretic model, mm -hmm. from a classical game theoretic model, how do you determine the relative benefits of the, of the two? Yeah, uh, I've done it in my dissertation thesis and in the game theory, not in this one, but uh, I've basically tested uh, uh, the predictions that follow from the quantum model, which is the QQ equation, and I've derived four predictions and compared the classical and the quantum model. And yeah, uh, I found that the in in my experiment the results were really, really close to, to the quantum model. So this was this was my uh, yeah. I have two models and clear predictions, uh, qualitative and quantitative, from both models, and I compare them at, or test them against the experimental data. And do you do quantum response models? Or? I'm sorry. Do you test any quantum response models? Uh, I've considered that. But yeah, I, I would say that the difference to, to the quantum response models is mainly the conceptual, because yeah, you, you can have like mixed strategies, and but as as Michael was trying to explain, it's different from the, the superposition. And uh, for example, exa entanglement is possible only with the like quantum probability theory. But uh, I believe I, it's possible to design like using Bell e equations to design the social experiment, like psychological, to test entanglement. But I have never seen <laughs> anyone doing this, but well, I will be interested in. <laughs> after you finish the dissertation, that can be your next question. But I, yeah, yes, please. It's a good question. In this in this kind of work, I looked on the like individual uh, agent, and I considered their position to be like shared through language. So I I considered them to share the same superposition basically in the society. So I have used some like control variables to control for that. But uh, yeah, it could be really nice like extension of this of this model how to like a group of people, for example, playing a uh, prisoner's dilemma game, uh, how you can model it in this model. Yeah, but I have not <laughs> done this. I have a question for actually our physicists here. Uh, uh -huh. You expressed some skepticism, Catherine, about the applicability of, of quantum concepts to social behavior because the physicists don't understand them. Having seen a presentation where at least on the quantum probability theory toolkit, do you sense that, are you more optimistic now about some possible cross-fertilization? I would have, I don't, so I think I would clarify that um, I'm not skeptical about the application of quantum concepts because I, I'm, I'm actually just skeptical about believing in that important authority in physics. I think it's totally fine and productive to take quantum concepts and apply them wherever. Moreover, this to me um, looks like it's in category two on my economy. Yeah. I, I have it here <laughs> in, in my notes that it's it's number two of your taxonomy, <laughs> so I support that. <laughs> but so I, yeah, I, I, I feel like a physicist would have nothing like that's cool. That'd yeah, but I, I would I would su support Alexis notes or comments on this that in, in from my perspective as the PhD student, I was basically looking for some application I can like any bridge I can find between quantum probability theory and the social theory and the most like natural one was the game theory and prisoners dilemma game because yeah and there's like experimentally yeah experimentally and I in my dissertation I do not have any claims about 
like what does it really mean about about the social world? But because for me, it's the like mathematical model, and if it works, it say something for others, but not for me. And there are some like predictions and like new concepts that can help develop like thinking about, for example, rational choice theory. But yeah, it's for me, it's another uh, mathematical model you can use. Okay. So. So the, apparently the cabs are now here, waiting outside for us. And it's quarter six. I guess we'll yeah. wrap it up now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh,